Amen. We're going to look in our Bibles at 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. Ladies, just a reminder, make sure you get signed up for the Ladies Prayer Conference. And that will be on uh, March the 18th and 19th. That's a Friday afternoon and for, uh, Saturday morning. Uh, we've got some good things there planned for you. Uh, really giving the opportunity to gather together and uh, pursue the Lord. And uh, so make sure you get signed up for the, uh, the ladies' uh, prayer conference. I want to share a message entitled, That I May Show Kindness, out of 2 Samuel chapter 9. And uh, we're going to begin reading in uh, verse 1. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba, when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lain on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machar, the son of Amiel, in Lodibar. And then the king David sent and fetched. Uh, uh, then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machar, the son of Amiel, uh, the, uh, from Lodibar. Uh, when and now when Mephibosheth. These are real great names to have to pronounce. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> uh, now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and uh, I don't know why I'm preaching this message and I can never say that name correct. And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David uh, said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, now What is thy servant that thou shouldst look upon such a dead dog as I am? And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given to thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servants, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, say the, say the king, He shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth uh, had a, a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for allowing us to have this passage in front of us tonight. Uh, help us uh, take uh, to heart, Lord, the, the comment that David made that he wanted to show kindness someone into the house of Saul and Lord I pray that you would speak to our hearts in a special way tonight about someone that we can show kindness to and we can share our faith with them Lord and show them of the goodness of God and the grace of God uh, that can save them and so Lord we need you to speak to us we need your Holy Spirit to be <laughs> our teacher tonight and Lord we want to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and so bless us now as we study, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our text verse is verse 3. The king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto him, Jonathan hath yet a son 
who is lame on his feet, so that I may show kindness. How often do we really stop and think about that thought of who can I deliberately show kindness to? Uh, oftentimes we walk past people every day and our mind, I have to confess, my thought is not when I walk past them, what can I do to be kind to them or show them the kindness of God? And oftentimes as we do that, we miss out on great opportunities to be able to help people understand the grace of God so that they can be glorious saved, gloriously saved. Oftentimes in ministry, I've seen some pretty cold heartedness over the years. I've seen some things done that just wasn't very kind. And, uh, and I've heard statements from people that just are supposed to be Christians, faithful to the Lord, faithful in the house of God, uh, but certainly were not <laughs> kind words that would encourage someone. Many times we're just caught up in the duties, so to speak, of the ministries that we enjoy and we fulfill them. Sometimes it's just about money. People are worried about money. They or they want to brag about the offerings they give. Oftentimes it's simply we want to remove the guilt trip in our own life, and so we're unkind towards someone else. And yet Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than a man shall lay down his life for his friends. And so this matter of showing kindness one towards another and uh, helping people to know, as we saw this morning, that God is not only a compassionate God, but he is a kind God. Because he has extended to us his grace that we might be saved. And he wants us to share that with others also. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32, says it be ye kind one towards another tender-hearted forgiving one another even as god for christ's sake hath forgiven you and all the times when troubles come difficulties come wrongs are done to us uh, we become very callous and indifferent uh, because of the fact that the world is a cold place and a hard place to live and but we need the tenderness of the spirit of god to rest upon us so that we might be concerned as David is, that he might be able to be kind to someone of the house of Saul. Now you understand the relationship between Saul and David was not really the best of relationships. Saul pursued David uh, to try to take his life. Uh, but yet David says, I want to be kind to somebody in the house of Saul. And so can we show kindness? Oswald Smith said this, the church that does not evangelize will fossilize. And so you have to understand that God has called us to show the kindness and the love of Christ to other people. If we're not going to be willing to talk to other people, uh, then certainly the church will die off. And uh, we often talk about it, that evangelists come in and preach and they testify the fact of how many churches are closing down across America every year. And I do understand that churches do uh, fall apart and they close down. But I wonder if sometimes if it just not, if it just is the reality that we're not willing to be gracious and kind to others to bring them to Christ, that is the cause. I don't know what the cause is. But I just, know, I just know this, that God has called us to reach out to others and be kind to them. And certainly we're to be kind one to another in the church. But listen, out in the world, people need to know uh, the kindness of God. I like what Henry Martin said. He was a missionary to India and to Persia. He said this, the spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions. The nearer we get to him, the more intense missionary we become. And as I read that quote, I wanted to share that quote because of the fact I thought of this, is as we get closer to God, is it an automatic move of the Spirit in our hearts to show forth the love of Christ and the tenderness of God? Is, it, is, is uh, being unkind or being callous is it evidences of us moving away from the Lord, of backsliding and not being concerned for others? I'm just asking a question. John Wesley said this, you have one business on earth and that's to save soul. Amen. And the church, the church is here. We enjoy all kinds of things. We just had a basketball tournament with our school and all this and the other. We have a prayer conference coming up and for the ladies, we had a great time at the men's prayer conference. Amen. We have all these things that are going on, but you do understand 
that the primary objective of all of these things is that we might be able to save souls. That we might be able to show the love and the kindness of God to people. And if we lose that perspective, uh, then all we are is just having meetings every week. That's all we're doing. And so we need the kindness of God on our hearts. And we need to consider, as David is considering, who can I show kindness in the house of Saul? And Ziba comes along and says, now wait a minute, Jonathan has a son that is lame in his feet. Now oftentimes we think we get kind of build this mindset, well, people are nice to me, I'll be nice to them. Uh, maybe they don't have the ability to be nice. Maybe they're like a, a, a Mephibosheth, they're lame in their feet. Spiritually, we know they're lame. Spiritually, we know they don't uh, know uh, the, the will and the plan of God for their life. And so that means somebody else has to take the initiative to reach out to others. And so we have one business on this earth, and that is to save souls. Doesn't matter whether you're a pastor or a deacon or a Sunday school teacher or what we often call lay people in the church. Uh, we, I, I hate to, to say, set it up, pastor, deacon, and lay people. I hate that. Uh, because of the fact that there is no hierarchy of religion in the church. We're all the same. We may be gifted and called to different responsibilities, but we're all on an even playing field. And uh, so we all need to have a brokenness and a tenderness uh, with a desire that we might be able to find somebody that we can show kindness to. And so let's consider this uh, relationship here that we unfolds in 2 Samuel chapter 9. First of all, uh, we see Mephibosheth's condition, his condition in verse 3. And he says simply, Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. So what does that mean? First of all, because he's, his condition is that he's lost. And I think we need to be reminded over and over again that people that are not saved, they are lost. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, it says that the Son of Man came for what? To seek and to save that which was lost. And uh, without Christ in our life, we have no hope, we have no direction, we have no peace, we have no assurance. And so people are lost without Christ in their life. And the people of God need to be reminded that. Because I hear people a lot of times, well, they're a nice person. Well, they might be a lost, nice person, but they're still lost. Yeah, but they really take care of the family. That's wonderful. They should. But they're still lost. They were without hope. And if we are without Christ in our life, then we absolutely have no hope uh, for the future. And so this Jonathan, son, Mephibosheth, was one who was lame, so he could not support himself. He could not labor. Uh, he could not uh, uh, move around on his own. He needed help to move around. And so when you think about someone who is lost, it is someone who absolutely cannot take control of their life spiritually because they do not have Jesus Christ as their Savior and our spirit is not dwelling in them. So let's remind ourselves when we see the world that they're lost. We get, oftentimes we get upset and with the way the world lives, the corruptness that they uh, uh, embrace, the depravity that we see, but that's what lost sinners do. When someone has no direction in their life, they do not know Christ as their Savior, they're going to live according to the dictates of the lust of the flesh. Amen. And so we wouldn't expect them to act any different. They need to hear about Christ. So when you see people caught up in those type of lifestyles, you need to be willing to say, Lord, will you give me a tender heart so that I can show them kindness, that I can talk to them in a way that I'm not judging them, I'm not condemning them, I'm not uh, defaming them, but I'm showing them that I truly am concerned about them. And so he is lost. I see also that he has no strength because it says that he is lame. And so he does not have the strength uh, to uh, pull himself up into a relationship with a living God. In Romans chapter 5, in uh, verse 6, 
Paul says, for when ye, we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. No man has the ability, the strength, to be able to save himself. No one has the strength or the ability to be able to uh, get themselves out of uh, the pits of sin. It is the grace of God that brings them out. And I remember before I got saved, I was an alcoholic, and I tell you, I don't know how many times, I said, well, I'm going to stop drinking. I didn't have the strength to stop drinking. But when I trusted Christ as my Savior, I acknowledged that while I was lost and acknowledged the fact that I had no strength within myself. God saved me and delivered me from that uh, filthy booze. And so he has no strength. He's lame in his feet. Paul says in verse 7, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so uh, we absolutely have no strength as Mephibosheth was lame in his feet. Uh, he could not move around on his own. He had no strength whatsoever. And so his condition is he's lost and without strength. And also in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12, he is without hope. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12, he is without hope. Paul says this, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. What a horrible way to live is to live our life without hope. And uh, I'll tell you, people are hungry. People are desiring to know where they can turn to find hope for tomorrow. This whole thing with Ukraine going on, I hope you're praying for Ukraine. I hope you're praying for that whole situation is there. And, and uh, these uh, mad men people that are in positions of leadership, uh, who knows what's going to take place and what's going to come out of this situation there. But I know this, I still have hope in God. Amen. Amen. And people who do not know Christ, they do not have not received Christ as their Savior, have no hope. They need somebody to be kind to them and just tell them there is hope if you just turn it to the Lord. That we might set our hope in God. The psalmist speaks about there's always hope in God. There's always hope for tomorrow. And when we know Christ as our Savior, and Mephibosheth had no positive experience about what his life was going to be but David says I want to show kindness to somebody show me somebody who has no hope and they say well wait a minute Jonathan has a son uh, and he's lame at his feet so David goes and offers him uh, a place to stay at the king's table I just I want to always think about that uh, that he would be able to the rest of his life stay at the king's table. When you trust Christ as your Savior, you get to feast at the king's table. Amen. Then you're able to be there forever. Uh, David Livingston said this. Sympathy is no substitute for action. Uh, we can talk about soul winning. We can talk about witnessing. We can talk about being kind. We can talk about being loving. We can talk about all these things that the Bible says ought to characterize the life of a Christian, but it means nothing unless you're willing to do something about it. Amen. Now, can you look around you? Can you find somebody that you can connect with that needs the love of God and needs to have Christ as their Savior and deliberately show them the kindness of God? That's what David said. He said, just give me somebody. Is there somebody in the household of Saul that I can show kindness to. And so I see his condition. I believe David had this desire on his heart because of the condition of Jonathan's son. So his condition. I see, secondly, I think there's something we can learn about him because of his location. Notice in verse 4, And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Mekar, the son of Amiel in Lodibar. And so uh, what can we learn about his location? It says here that he is in the house of Micar. Now Micar in the Hebrew means soul. 
And when I read that, I thought about that. I was looking at his name, and I think it's important that specifically Ziba names the house that he's staying in, the person that he's staying in, and the location of that house. And so, my car means soul. Now, Romans chapter 7, Paul tells us that we are sold under sin. And I think this depicts for us the reality that uh, Mephibosheth is sold under sin. And, uh, you know, there, that's why the debt is too big for us to pay. Uh, the sin is too encompassing for us to control. And so when we think about this matter of kindness, realize this, that people are slaves to sin. People are, are, are under the power and the manipulation of sin. And there is absolutely no way to get out of it because they've been sold into it. And there's been a great price that was paid in order to be able to deliver them out of the bondage of sin. So I believe we, we talk about being sold under sin. But he's also in the, uh, of the son of Amiel. And uh, Amiel means uh, my kinsman is God. Now, in, in Galatians, I want to read this for you. In Galatians, chapter 6 and verse 10, uh, it says, And we have therefore opportunity, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. And so uh, his testimony here, his identification is, not only the fact is he sold, but he is a kinsman of God. And so why, why is that? We can be a kinsman of God because we have been bought with a price by our kinsman, our redeemer kinsman, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can have a relationship. So we ought to be kind, as Paul says, especially to the household of faith. And so how can we exercise kindness and love towards those who do not know Christ and despise Christ when we can't show the love of Christ to each other. And so I see this matter, he is the son of Emil, my kinsman is God. And that's what he needed. He needed to come into the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And then it says he's from Lodibar. Lodibar simply means not a pastor. In other words, there was no place of rest. There was no place of safety. There was no place of provision for him. That's why David will tell uh, Ziba, now listen, you and your sons and your servants are now going to till the fields for Mephibosheth and you're going to reap the fruit and give it to him so he has food to eat. Why is that? Because Mephibosheth was from Lodibar, which was no pastor. In other words, there was no means <coughs> for him to reap food, fruit, to provide for himself because of the fact that he was lame in his feet. And so Psalm 23, verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And Mephibosheth had to come to a place of enjoying the provision of God through the reality of David wanting to show kindness to him. And, you know, the, the young saved do not enjoy or experience the ability to be feasting or grazing or resting on the pasture that God has for us. And so uh, I think the names are significant. They identify his condition and who he is. So we see his condition, his location. Then in verse 5, I see his invitation. Then David sent and fetched him out of his house of Micar, the son of Emil, uh, from Lodibar. And so I see the concern for the king, of the king, I'm sorry, the concern of the king. You know, Jeremiah would write in Jeremiah 3 and 5, 51, he said, My eye hath affected my heart. And here is David. He's wanting to do show kindness to someone. 
And the person that is brought to his eye or to his attention was Mephibosheth, who was lame with his feet. And so David was stirred with the reality uh, that uh, he saw the condition, he saw the location, and he understood the need of somebody being kind to him. And so uh, we know Jesus said in Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 6 and verse 34, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. It's amazing to see in the Gospels how many times that it, did, it, it mentions the compassion of Christ. May we be able to see the multitudes and be able to see their condition in a way that will move us to have compassion on them so that we might extend the invitation to them to come to church. You know, oftentimes we say, well, you know, we, we, I've invited, I've had people say, that, oh, I talked to so-and-so, they won't come to church. Well, there's somebody else. You know, I like going fishing. I go out on my boat and I go fishing, and I'm not catching any fish. I don't sit there all day. Amen. I move the boat and go somewhere else. And uh, I'm very impatient. Amen. And if I don't catch anything, I'm going somewhere else. And because why? Because if I'm not going to catch anything, I'm going to enjoy a boat ride. Amen. <laughs> but anyway, uh, if you're trying to lead someone to the Lord, you're trying to get someone to come to church, you're trying to show the kindness of God, and they're rejecting it, then move on to somebody else. The problem is, oftentimes we'll try to bring someone to Christ, and they'll reject Christ, and then we just say, well, nobody will get saved. And we just stop being a witness of the testimony. We need God to once again impress on our hearts. There are people that need you to show the kindness of God. And so look at people, see people in their condition, because it will affect your heart. The eye will affect the heart. I, I was shocked when I got saved. I don't know about you. When I got saved... And I got involved with soul winning. I went off to Bible college and we were involved with the bus ministry and going up. I was shocked the way people live. I was. I was shocked. I was shocked that you'd walk into a house and there's drugs and alcohol sitting right out in the open with all the kids in the household running around. And they had no problem with it. That's what they're accustomed to. That's what they're used to. I was shocked. And it broke my heart. When I saw the condition of the people and I understood what, what their need was, it certainly gave me a spirit of wanting to be kind to them and try to help them in any way that I can. And so oftentimes I think we just need to get with somebody who is lost, understanding the condition they're in and realize they just need somebody to be nice to them and present to them who Christ is. So I see the concern of the king. I see the plan of the king. It just says here, then King David sent. He sent somebody out. And uh, I remember years ago, I did a series on how to be an effective soul winner. And I said this, number one, you gotta go. Number two, you gotta open up your mouth and say something. <laughs> you can't be effective and being a testimony for the Lord and showing people that God cares for them if you won't go to somebody and talk to them and open your mouth up and tell them who Jesus Christ is. And uh, listen, when I got saved, I wasn't excited about going out and talking to people. I, and I'm still hesitant, even to this day, I get up to preach, I'm nervous about it. And I'm always, I'm, I'm always nervous about getting up here and talking in front of people. I'm always nervous. Uh, talking to people. That's why I love driving tractor and trailer. Because I'd get in my truck, and it's just me and the truck and the diesel fumes, amen? <laughs> and i just drive that baby, and I don't have to worry about anybody. And then I got saved, and I started going into the truck stop or whatever, and God would deliberately bring people over to sit next to me. And I'm probably like saying, isn't there a seat down there? <laughs> This is my space, amen. And God would bring people over and they would just deliberately start talking to me. So, amen. hey, you got to talk to them about the Lord, amen. And uh, God opened up and God showed me this that God has a plan, and that plan is He wants to send us to people who are hurting. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. His plan is He sent Christ into this world. 
And his plan is that he wants to send us out. C.S. Lewis said this. I thought it was an interesting statement. He said this. There is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. You need to think about that. Amen. Because everywhere you go, God has claimed that area for himself and Satan's fighting to take it away. Every person you come in contact with, God has so orchestrated for you to be in contact with that person and God wants their heart, God wants their life and Satan is fighting for their soul. So there, there is no neutral ground. Everywhere we go, every moment that we live, we are in a spiritual battle for the glory of God. And so we see the concern of the king, we see the plan of the king, we see the command of the king. And so David sent, and he said, and he fetched him out of the house. And so he snatched him up. I'm glad that God wants to snatch us up. I'm glad he gave us the great commission going out and snatching people out of hell uh, by sharing our faith in Christ <coughs> with them, showing the kindness of God. David Livingston said this, Christ alone can save the world, but Christ cannot save the world alone. And um, if Jesus wants, he can just, boom, zap, and everybody's saved. But the reality is, God's plan, God's design, is that he wants us, whom he has saved, to be kind to those that are lost, so that we can point them to Jesus Christ, that they might be saved. And so I see the condi his condition. I see his location. I see the invitation that's offered. Hudson Taylor said this. Hudson Taylor was a missionary to China. And he, uh, he mentions this as the progression of the call of God on his life. He said this as when he was a child, when he was at five years old, he said this. When I'm a man, I mean to be a missionary to go to China. And then he became a young man. And as a young man, he said, I feel I cannot go on living unless I do something for China. So what are we going to do for people who need to know the kindness of God? Do we, do we have a burden at this stage in our life to show the kindness of Christ to somebody? And then he said this, late in life as a veteran missionary, he said this, if I had 1,000 lives, I'd give them all for China. Amen. And then we wonder why a man like Hudson Taylor was successful in leading so many people to Christ. I mean, he was in it for the long haul. Amen. He was in it in the reality that somebody needed to know the kindness of God. And I, I don't care if you're five years old, I don't care if you're a teenager. I don't, I don't care if you're middle-aged. I don't care if you're a senior saint. God needs every one of us and commands every one of us and gives an example to us through David that we need to look for people to whom we can show the kindness of God. And then I see his salvation. Notice grace that is extended in verse 7. David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Now Mephibosheth was very nervous when David sent to have him brought to the king's house. He didn't know what was going to happen. He knew the conflict between Saul and, uh, and David. And as he didn't know what was going to go on. But David simply says this. Don't worry. You don't have to be fearful. Because I'm going to show you kindness. It's interesting. That it doesn't show, he's not saying I'm showing you kindness because of the fact that you're laying <laughs> in your feet. He said I'm going to show you kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake. And will restore. And you know, God is kind to us 
because of his son's sake. Because Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. Because he has done everything to extend to us God's grace so that we might be able to be saved. And God is kind to us for his son's sake. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works. Uh, lest any man should boast. Uh, Paul said where sin did abound. Grace did much more abound. And where this physical condition hindered and hampered. Uh, Mephibosheth from being able to live, provide for himself. And to live his life. There was grace that was extended from David. To give him deliverance and blessings because David wanted to show him kindness. Then there's restoration offered in verse 7. Because he says this, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. And I'm glad that uh, God restores us. You know, Adam and Eve sit in the garden. And they, they sit in the garden. They were cast out of the garden. But there was a, an animal slain. The blood was shed so that they could be reconciled to their God. And so an illustration for us of the kindness of God. And so grace extended, restoration offered, adoption applied. That's what it says in verse 11. Then said Ziba unto the king, according to all that the Lord, thy, I'm sorry, according to all that my Lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. We are adopted into the family of God. As many as he received him, that then gave me the power to become the sons of God. I'm thankful tonight that the kindness of God, that he has adopted me into his family. And people, listen, people are hurting, families are dysfunctional, things are falling apart. Uh, we need to tell people that they can be part of a family that is an everlasting family that's filled with the love and the kindness of the Lord. Then I see security experience in verse 13. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. His physical condition didn't change. But his location did, and his relationship did. And uh, so he is secured. Ecclesiastes 3.14 says, I know whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing can be taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. Amen. Now I'm going to tell you something. Ziba's life was impacted because of David offering Oh, uh, the opportunity to show kindness and as a result of it Mephibosheth was secured in the king's house and I'll guarantee you there was nothing that could get him out of the king's house Amen. and because the king said this is where he's going to be and he's going to eat continually at my table I'm thankful that we're secure in Christ I'm thankful Jesus said I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Hudson Taylor said this, and I don't know if I put this one on there. Did I put this? I didn't put this one on. Hudson Taylor said this, Would that God would make hell so real to us that we cannot rest. When, when you think of hell, yeah. how, how does it affect your, your soul? How does it affect your spirit? Would to God that God would make hell so real to us that we cannot rest. Heaven so real that we must have men there. Christ so real that our supreme motive and aim shall be the mate, the man of sorrows, the man of joy by the conversion to him of many. Well, listen, tonight, hell is real. Amen. There's a multitude of people that are on the way there that need somebody to show them kindness. Heaven's real. Man, I'll tell you what a glorious time that will be when we get to heaven and see people that we've led to the Lord. And I've led people to the Lord driving bus. I've led people to the Lord driving tractor and trailer. 
I've led people to the Lord being involved in bus ministry. I've been led people to the Lord by just going out door to door soul winning. Many of those people I've led to the Lord I've never seen again. But I know one thing, when I get to heaven, I'm going to see them when I get there. Heaven needs to be so real to us that we understand as David brought Mephibosheth into his household and secured him there, <coughs> that God wants us to bring people into his household and secure them there. And so it needs to be real. Hey, hey, heaven needs to be as real as you sitting here right now looking at each other. It needs to be that deeply impressed on your heart. But hell needs to be so real when we think of the possibility of somebody that we walk past that they're going to die and go to hell. It stirs our hearts and say, oh, God, give me an opportunity to show kindness. May that be our prayer tonight. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. My Father, I come to you. I thank you so much, Lord, for many ways that you have blessed us, how you help us, how you save us. Uh, God, how you enable us to have opportunities to be able to speak to others about the uh, sureness of salvation through faith in Christ. Uh, Lord, I'm thankful for David. Uh, that he wasn't, didn't have a vengeful heart, a resentful heart, but he had a tender heart that wanted to show kindness to someone of the household of Saul. And I'm thankful, Lord, that we can glean some practical thoughts that help us to understand the significance and also the outcome of showing the kindness of God to others. Bless us, Lord. Give us someone to share our faith with this week. Give us the opportunity this week, Lord, to lead someone to Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing I Surrender All. While we're singing that, if you need to pray, why don't you come and pray here at the altar? Uh, but listen, God laid somebody on your heart as we're going through the message. Take some time this week to reach out to them and let them know that God loves them. Surrender it all to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I surrender all.
or if you're a member of the church there's some out there for the membership we're trying to get a new directory put together so if you can fill those things out and get them uh, turned into the office we certainly would appreciate that amen copy what's the prayer right. dear lord just thank you for this day i thank you for the opportunity we have to come and worship you at your house today lord i just pray that we take these messages especially once that about loving the lost we apply them to our lives this week we find somebody that we know that doesn't know you as savior we talk to them lord show them the love and compassion that we need to lord just pray to you a good week bring us back safely in the new week and so we can worship you once again here lord in jesus name amen